Hello, hello everyone. I hope you're all doing really well and I hope you're ready to do some more National 5 chemistry. Today we're having a look at a new type of chemical reaction called cracking. And just like with a lot of other concepts in science and indeed when we're looking at the names of a chemical reaction, the name cracking gives us a pretty good clue as to what is going to be involved here. Quite simply, we're going to crack or break hydrocarbons. And if you crack or break something, you make it smaller. And that is essentially all cracking is. We're taking something that is a large hydrocarbon, cracking it and breaking it, and producing smaller, more useful ones. And as I've said, what we're wanting to do in this video is explore this chemical reaction called cracking. We want to get a definition for cracking. We want to look at the apparatus and the scientific setup for undergoing a cracking experiment and we'll also look at some chemical equations using cracking as well trying to predict what products we're going to produce. So cracking then, cracking of hydrocarbons, why is it important? Well if we kind of think back to when we talked about fractional distillation and the different fractions produced from crude oil. If you think about the kind of smaller fractions, the one at the top, the ones at the top of the fractional distillation column, we've got fractions like methane and petrol, very, very useful, very important. Whereas at the bottom of the column, we've got these bigger molecules, bigger hydrocarbons that aren't that useful. I mean, we can use them for tarmacking roads, etc. But it's mostly just kind of the waste products, residue they'd be called. So the shorter chained hydrocarbons are a lot more useful and more valuable than the longer chained hydrocarbons. So if we've got lots of long chained hydrocarbons why don't we just break them up to produce smaller more useful hydrocarbons and that's exactly what cracking is. Cracking allows you to break up these larger less useful molecules into these smaller more valuable, more useful hydrocarbon molecules. And you can see that in that little example there. We've got this long chained hydrocarbon, not too useful. If we crack it, then we can produce more useful, smaller hydrocarbons. So here's a diagram that shows the apparatus that we would set up if we were doing a cracking experiment in the classroom or in the lab. And we'll have a little talk through now about the procedure and the results and how do we know if we've cracked a long chained alkane and how do we know if we've produced these smaller more useful products. So our starting point for this cracking experiment is we're looking at the long chained alkane paraffin. Now paraffin's a, an alkane um, it is a saturated molecule, there's no carbon to carbon double bonds. So if we put paraffin directly into our brown bromine solution, the bromine solution would not turn clear and colourless because the paraffin's an alkane and doesn't have any carbon to carbon double bonds. If you remember, bromine solution turns clear and colourless only if we have something like an alkene where there is a carbon to carbon double bond present. So if we just start off with the paraffin and we put it directly into the bromine solution we'd, we'd see no colour change in the bromine solution. However, if we undergo our cracking experiment, our cracking process, where we essentially heat up um, the paraffin, heat up the paraffin oil and also heat up an important chemical here, um, the aluminium oxide, the catalyst in this experiment. If we heat up both of these um, compounds, then what happens is the paraffin starts to break down. And it starts to break down to produce, you guessed it, the smaller, more useful products. And what you actually get happening is there is some gas being produced and some gas passes through this tube here and that gas that comes out the tube will turn the bromine solution clear and colourless. So therefore that gas that we've produced not only is it smaller than the paraffin but it also must contain a carbon to carbon double bond and it must be an alkene. 
So the results from this experiment would be the following. The gas produced from the cracking reaction would decolorize the bromine water or bromine solution, telling us that the gas must be an alkene. It's also a gas compared to a liquid that we started with. We started with the liquid paraffin. We've now produced a gas, so that would suggest as well that we've made a, a kind of smaller molecule. And so putting all these things together, we know that if we crack a large chained hydrocarbon, like a large chained alkane, we can produce smaller, more useful molecules, and at least one of those molecules will be a alkene, will change into an alkene. We'll look at that a little bit further now, just to, to let it all sink in. Now there are a couple of important points to note here about the experiment that we've just had a little look at. One of the important things to note is a kind of, I suppose, a safety measure that you would have to be mindful of when undergoing this experiment. Now, at the end of the experiment, when you're looking to remove the bromine solution, if done in an incorrect way or an incorrect order, you can cause a, a phenomenon called suck back, where, if I flick back to this slide here, the bromine solution is sucked back, as the name would suggest, into the hot reaction test tube. And that would be quite dangerous because you're taking this kind of cool liquid and it's going to somewhere that's very, very hot and it's got other chemicals and it could cause the test tube to shatter. So to avoid this suck back, what you would have to do is to keep on heating, continue to heat your reaction mixture, keep heating this, and then at the same time slowly remove the bromine solution. If you remove the heat first, you create a kind of vacuum and the solution gets sucked up into this test tube. So you have to keep on heating the test tube to avoid suck back of the bromine solution. So that's one important thing to note in this experiment. Second important thing to note is the name of the catalyst used. Need to remember this for your National 5 exam, so just commit it to memory. The catalyst used is aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide. Could get a question on that in a test or final exam. So remember that please. Something else to note as well is the final products is actually a mixture of saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons. So you get a mixture of smaller, more useful alkenes, or rather sorry, alkanes for the saturated and unsaturated alkenes. So we get a mixture of both of these produced when we break up our large, less useful hydrocarbon. As we've been discussing the products of cracking, we know we're producing these two different products, the saturated and the unsaturated products. Now the reason for that is there's basically just not enough hydrogen atoms to give us two alkane molecules. If you break up an alkane, you're always going to produce an alkane and an alkene because there's not enough hydrogen atoms to go around to make two alkanes. So we're getting these long fractions split up into smaller alkanes and an alkene as well. Now here's another example of that when we're looking at the cracking of octane where we've got this long alkane. We're producing smaller molecules, both of these are smaller than our original or starting molecule and we've produced an alkene here with a carbon to carbon double bond and we've also produced a smaller alkane, a fully saturated molecule. So we're getting a little mixture of the two. Now this is this type of equation is what we're going to have a kind of look at now um, just for the last little bit of the video and basically we just need to understand that the concept is very similar to when we looked at balancing equations, the exact same principle is that when we've got eight carbon atoms on the left hand side on the reactant side of the chemical equation we must also have a total of eight carbon atoms on the product side and we do we've got six here and two there adds up to eight so we've still got eight carbons on both sides and the exact same true is true for the hydrogens 18 hydrogens on the reactant side 12 and 6 is 18 on the product side keeping that principle in mind we're going to have a look at some questions now and basically just figure out and work out what um, one of the missing products would be. Now here are those 
equations. We've got one, two, three, four. You can have a go at it now. It's it's really not not difficult. Um, and try and figure out what would be the missing products here, keeping in mind that we must have the exact same numbers of carbons and hydrogens on each side of the arrow. So we've got six and fourteen on this left hand side here on the starting products, or starting reactants rather, what will be our products on this side. So then on my product side I know I've got one carbon already, I've got six on my reactants, it has to be the same number so therefore I have to have five carbons on this product. One add five is six, easy peasy. Now how many hydrogens am I going to have? Well I know I've got 14 to start off with. I've already got four here in this methane molecule, so in order to get up to 14 on this side as well, I'm going to have to have 10 hydrogens in this final product. So what we're starting with here is our long-chained alkane. We've got hexane, and we're breaking it up into a smaller alkane, methane, which is very useful, and another smaller molecule but this time, since we've already got an alkane, and we know we always produce a mixture of an alkene and an alkene, well, we must have an alkene here, and we do. We have pentene, and pentene would have a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond. Right, let's look at the next one. Of all of these, we're starting with hexane. We've always got six carbons and 14 hydrogens. Um, on the left-hand side of the arrow, we can kind of think about the equation in being the equations as being in two halves with we put a line here on the arrow here is our left hand side and here is our right hand side and the numbers must add up on both sides six carbons here only two here right I must have four carbons on this side 14 hydrogens on the left hand side the right hand side so far we've only got six hydrogens so we must have eight hydrogens here as well to make it up and again we've got a mixture of an alkane and an alkene being produced. Third one now, six here, carbons that is, two here so again we must have another four carbons on the right hand side, 14 hydrogens and only four here so we're missing 10 hydrogens so we're looking at C4H10 as our missing product. And the last one, three hyd three carbons rather on this side. Six on the left hand side, so we're missing three. Hydrogens, 14. And eight, so we're missing six. And there we are. Quite straightforward as long as we remember the principle that the number of carbons and hydrogens or any atoms in a chemical equation must be the same on both sides.